Lean represents a very significant revolution in the way we think about running businesses. The Japanese after World War II. Japanese industry was bombed flat. There was nothing there. They were trying to do more with less. Their best trained people oftentimes got uh, um, drafted, and so they didn't even have all necessarily the best skills there. So they're trying to figure out how to do more with more with less. And if you look at it, that's where we usually put the ties to, to lean, the origin of lean in the early 1950s at, at Toyota. The, one of the things we miss is when you step back and look at what they're doing with lean and what lean's all about is it's about continuous improvement first and foremost, ongoing continuous improvement. But in order to get the continuous improvement, it's about looking at things in a different light that shows things we don't normally see. Look at lean accounting. My gosh, it's out there in the open and you can see, oh, that's our material cost. None of this silly allocation stuff, uh, keep that down, just keep it clean so it's actionable, clear, so we can focus on continuous improvement and making things more efficiently, and the things that are important, the things that are important to the customer. Lean is all about organizational learning, learning how to operate more effectively. Because while we have learning in people's knowledge, where it's primarily tied in, is the processes, the policies, the systems, all of those improvements that are captured and incorporated into your organization. This is how you learn. So the whole thing is learning at a pace faster than your competitors. Your ability to manage ideas, the ideas of your people, all your people, is the critical element in your rate of learning. So the better you handle ideas. Now, we run into a lot of organizations that said, well, we want to be creative. We don't want to put any systems in place. We don't want to restrict that. Yeah, you can't make sure you're learning. You don't have the systems to learn unless they're in place. When you have a system, a good system for getting frontline ideas and listening to the people on the front lines, 80% of the improvements in the company tend to come from the front line and 20% from management. Brazilata, one of our, our newest ones, uh, they're down in Sao, Sao Paulo, Brazil. They were named last year as the most innovative company in Brazil. The year before, it was Embraer, the airframe manufacturer. Now, I don't imagine anyone here knows what Brasilata makes. Steel cans. Can you imagine an older industry, steel cans? 75% of their products are either new within the last three years or protected by patents. They're some of the most fascinating cans you've ever seen. And how do they do it? 165 implemented ideas from every one of their 900 employees. It's nuts watching them go through and constantly improving in the rate they are. The fun thing about Brasilate is they're so integrated, integrated their frontline ideas with their R&D group they can't tell where ideas came from. So how do you get employee ideas? Do they just come automatically? Or do you have to go after them? What sort of systems do you put in place? We've been playing around the edges on this a little bit, but we're going to get into a couple of the different types of systems. First, the things you don't do is put up a suggestion box. The suggestion box is perfect for the command and control organization, where management has to have a tight fist on absolutely everything, so they have the illusion of control. Not real control, but the illusion of control. OK, that's the suggestion box. What we're talking about is a different type of system, what we call a high performance idea system. So what I'm going to do is go through the 10 primary rules of idea management. First one, set the foundation with standard work. In other words, document what you do. Why is that important for ideas? The answer is very simple. If you don't know what you're doing, you don't know whether to improve it or not.
And standards are very important because that gives you the starting point. And that's also, remember how we capture learning? When the idea comes in to improve it, we change the standard. Then the question is, who owns the standard? Does management own it or do the folks that are actually doing the work? That's another question we have to think about because it should be the people closest that own it that are doing the work so they can just change it at a rapid rate. Okay, set the foundation. Secondly, this is the fun one for me. Focus on small ideas, not big ones. Go after small ideas. Small ideas cannot be duplicated very well. They can happen every day, but the thing you have to have is a system that can just implement them, that can judge them. And if they need more resources, if they need more permission, if they're larger ideas, they can easily be escalated. That's part of the trick of a good system. Stay away from rewards, especially percentage rewards. Nothing shuts things down faster than offering people a piece of the action. It only seems fair. You know, they save you $100,000. Give them $10,000, right? Only seems fair, right? What's the problem? Start thinking about that. First of all, how much is that lean idea saving you? Uh, remember that $100,000 idea that they came up with? What was it saving? It wasn't saving money. It was saving creating capacity. So now all of a sudden you say, wait a minute, I saved you all this time, and you're saying it didn't save me any money? gets into a whole lot of problems, and as uh, Bill would say, it's uh, wasted work. Number four, make it a regular part of your job. This is a critical part. This is part of lean. Lean for lean, a regular part of everyone's work is improvement. Remember what we're trying to do, where we're trying to go. That's a critical component of everyone's job. The frontline folks, the frontline folks need to be coming up with the ideas. They're closest to it. Supervisors need to be mentoring and coaching and helping them. If they come up with a bad idea, it's a coaching opportunity. Um, management, middle management has to make sure they have the resources they need. Upper management has to make sure the system is working well. Everyone's got a task. And people have to be held accountable, have to be held accountable for performance. And this means especially upper and middle management. Use a good process. This is a critical element. A um, couple of processes, and we've, we've heard elements of them come up. The first, first process, there's, there's sort of three processes that we run into in high-performance ideas. One is the original Japanese Kaizen-type system. Not the Kaizen blitzes and events, but the Kaizen Teon uh, systems. And that is an interesting history because it actually grew out of suggestion boxes. It grew out of the Ford box that, uh, that was, was seen in, uh, um, in Toyota's uh, trip over in uh, 1950. But they made a lot of changes in it to make it work because suggestion boxes just don't work well. But the next one is what we call the idea meeting. This is what Sweden had. This is what uh, our friends in, um, at the Clarion had. Once every two weeks, in their case, they'd get together and they'd all come with ideas. And they'd go around the room and everyone would share their ideas now. The advantage of an idea meeting like this is twofold. First of all, everyone's hearing the ideas and they're discussing them before they decide to move them forward. So they can get quick refinement. They can assign who does the idea, who's, who, who implements it by next time. Very action oriented and very sharing. As a matter of fact, a number of the companies we work with have taken their, their, their weekly departmental meetings away and put in an idea meeting in place of it because that everything is improvement oriented. And there's a few and announcements and the stuff that you used to be able to cover in meetings can be done by email these days. The other thing you can do is if you have a specific problem facing the department that they have to do, you can ask people for their ideas and they can think about it for a while and come back to the next meeting with the ideas. So it's very strategic in its element. Now, the other one we're talking about is called the idea, we call the idea board. This is very similar to what uh, Scania uses. Uh, this is just sort of a generic uh, discussion board. You've basically got the team name across the top. At Scania, for example, what they do is they focus on three metrics. Three metrics, safety, quality, and downtime. Now, the interesting thing about this system is, remember, this is in, a, in a, an assembly line situation at Scania. So 
if there's a safety problem, quality problem, or a downtime problem, every day at 5 o'clock, the line shuts down for eight minutes all over the plant. And everyone goes to their idea boards. Shut it down for eight minutes. Bang. If there's a safety problem and they can solve it, they keep it, for example. But let's say there's a safety problem that they need more resources that they can't solve. At 8.15, seven minutes after they've started the line again, it goes to the supervisor's board where the supervisors on that line get together because they have more resources. If they can't solve it, by 8.30, it goes to the line manager's meeting and there is posted visibly on their idea board. If it still can't be solved, at 9.30, the plant manager with all of his direct reports has the problem on his board. So you can have a problem that was botted by a frontline person that was beyond their control, their resources, can get escalated all the way up to the plant manager in an hour and a half. Now, it's visibly on the plant manager's for, board. Think about visual control. Think about visual accountability. Talking about flipping the pyramid, now the plant manager is responsible for an issue initiated by someone on the front line. And every day this takes place. How do you think they get 15% improvement in productivity every year? Provide time and resources. This is one of the big things we run into a lot. And with Blackburn, also with an insurance company, he's the CEO of um, Allianz China. And when he moved into Allianz China, talking about visual control, the first thing he did was knock out all the walls because people weren't working well together. So he literally blew the walls out between departments. So now you can see all the way through it. He took all the, the um, uh, cubicles and dropped them down to desktop height. And then he ran into problems. He's a Brit. With a Wolf Blackburn, I thought first was a, was, was a German because it's a German company out of Munich. Uh, but his German master says, no, you can't knock down the walls to your office because it'll make your successor's job more difficult. So he didn't knock them down. He replaced them with glass. So his walls are all glass. But the net result of that is, is in order to try to get people together, his, his new Chinese um, head of, uh, uh, H, of um, IT comes in and tries to petition him for more resources. And Wolf's immediate response was, I'll tell you what, you can hire as much help as you want, but I don't want to see any delays whatsoever when ideas come in and you have to respond to them. So that was part of his lean initiative. And he created a company that was so flexible that, one, that they won an award recently by the Chinese insurance industry for a product. Normally, you, don't have, you can't have a sustainable product because everyone copies it in the insurance industry. You have a good product, bang, it's copied instantaneously in China. Well, the problem was his internal operations were so flexible, he could offer a product that nobody else could offer because it required that flexibility because he took lean into insurance. Basically, what we're talking about here is make sure that what's important at the strategic level is actually actionable at the front lines with people's ideas. So when the ideas come in, they're focused where they're needed. Idea activators, a lot of lean is idea activators. One of our favorite idea activators, believe it or not, is what's called a BHAG, a big, hairy, audacious goal. That comes from Jim Collins' uh, first book, Built to Last. For example, the 747 for Boeing was a BHAG, a big, hairy, audacious goal. They bet like about five years' profits on the 747 because it was so expensive to make. They won big. OK, last thing, you want to celebrate success. Doesn't mean you have to pay people big bonuses or anything like that to do what's right. It's part of their job. But darn, you need to celebrate when the team wins.